This is Glenn Robinson, President of the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. I would like to welcome you to our newest edition of Quick Takes on International Affairs. Please enjoy this talk and do consider joining the World Affairs Council. Hello, members of the World Affairs Council of Monterey, California. I'm Gregory Gauze. I teach Middle East politics at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. It's a pleasure to be with you today virtually, although I very much look forward to the time when the plague passes and we can get together in person. I had a visit to your World Affairs Council some years ago, enjoyed it immensely, and uh, would love to come back. Uh, I want to talk today about the Persian Gulf and what the Biden administration is going to face in the Persian Gulf. And what I'm going to do is occasionally share my screen with you to just show you some maps and some pictures to reinforce uh, points I'm going to make in this brief video. So let me start the screen share right, right now. Those of you who follow politics in the Middle East probably know that, that one of the most popular framings for politics in the Persian Gulf area is a fight between Sunnis and Shia, the two great sects of Islam. Uh, Iran being uh, uh, the dominant Shia Muslim power in the region, and you can see on this map, well over 90% of the population of Iran being Shia Muslims. And Saudi Arabia is, is depicted as the leader of Sunni Islam. And this, this fight between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia for influence in the region is very frequently portrayed as, as a yet another iteration of what's depicted as this centuries old fight between Sunnis and Shia. I would like you to think about it in another framing. First of all, well, it, I don't want to deny the importance of, of sect. I mean, in these civil wars that we've seen in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, the political fights in Lebanon, the earlier civil wars, sect means a lot. People do mobilize on that basis and, and people can, can uh, it's, it can be a matter of life or death, whether you're a Sunni or a Shia in a particular context. But I really don't think that Iran and Saudi Arabia are driven purely by sectarian motives in this fight. I think that what this is, is a balance of power conflict between two states that see each other as rivals, who are using the sectarian element, which has emerged bottom up in places like Iraq and Lebanon and Syria and Yemen when the state has collapsed. I also want to point out that this is not simply a two-sided fight. Right? On your screen, you see three pictures. One of them on, on the left, on my left, as I'm looking at the screen, is uh, Ali Khamenei, who is the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran. In the middle is uh, King Salman of Saudi Arabia. Those are the leaders of the two states that most people look upon as the, the ones who are fighting for influence in the Gulf and in the Middle East more generally in this sectarian fight. But I've added one more leader to this screen and that's the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Erdogan also represents an ideological stance in this fight for influence in the Middle East. President Erdogan has supported bottom-up populist Sunni political Islam, represented in many places in the Arab world by the Muslim Brotherhood. And while the Saudis see the Iranians as a rival, they also see the Turks as a rival in places like Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood won the presidency after the Arab Spring, and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and other of its supporters work to try to get the military to overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood president, whose name was Mohammed Morsi, whom the Turks supported. So understanding this geopolitical fight purely as a Sunni Shia fight misses that essential element that the Turks are also involved in this contest for influence in places like Syria, 
in the Palestinian territories, even in Iraq itself, and maybe even in Yemen. And so I think that we should consider the, the, the regional crisis that the Biden administration is facing as it comes to power, not in terms of, of a sectarian fight between Sunnis and Shia, but a, a multilateral, at least three party and maybe more fight for the reconstitution of political authority in all of these places in the Arab world, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. We can even go out to Libya, although the Iranians are not as involved in that. And so it's a much more complicated fight, but also because it's not a purely sectarian fight, it, it's a fight that maybe you can get some compromise on. And I think that that's an important thing to consider. So what does the Biden administration, what are they looking for? And what are they confronting as they enter office? The Biden administration in the campaign and in uh, the writings that the leadership has done, Secretary of State Blinken, as well as President Biden, uh, as well as uh, Jake Sullivan, who's the National Security Advisor, have made clear that one of their top priorities is to try to return to the Iran nuclear deal, right? The formal name for this was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It was negotiated back in the Obama administration, and it set limits that the Iranians were willing to accept on their nuclear programs that moved them away from a theoretical point of being able to weaponize their nuclear programs, produce nuclear weapons. This was an agreement not just between the United States and Iran. You'll recall it was between the five permanent members of the Security Council. So the Russians were involved, the Chinese, the French, the British, and also the Germans were involved. The Trump administration, as you probably recall, withdrew from the JCPOA and applied a policy that they called maximum pressure on Iran. New sanctions, unilateral sanctions, but surprisingly effective ones because it basically cut Iran off from most of the world financial system. And thus the Iranians had a very hard time selling oil because how are you gonna pay for that oil if you're outside Iran, except to use the world financial system that the United States dominates. Like the threat of sanctions on third party buyers of Iranian oil basically kept Iranian oil, not completely, but largely off the market. And that was a real problem for the Iranians, but it didn't break the Iranians the way that the, the, the Trump administration had hoped. They didn't come back to the table to negotiate a quote unquote better deal. Rather, they resisted the Trump administration and, and uh, as we'll see, uh, acted to try to disrupt American interests, at least to some extent in the region. The Biden administration is looking to get back into the JCPOA. But the question is, will they be able to, and on what terms? So let's go back to shared screen. The person on the, the left-hand side of the screen, as I'm looking at it, is Hassan Rouhani, who is the president of Iran. He's the president of Iran who negotiated the original JCPOA. And his chief negotiator was the charming and perfectly fluent in English foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif. Uh, in many ways, uh, the American media's favorite Iranian, who is in the middle. Rouhani and Zarif basically uh, tied their political futures to an improvement in the Iranian economy that they hoped would come with the removal of the international sanctions, the UN sanctions, that came off with the signing of the nuclear deal. Their credibility was damaged when the Trump administration withdrew from the deal. And, and moreover, uh, Rouhani's term ends this summer. Uh, he's term limited to two terms and there will be an Iranian presidential election in the summer of 2021. Can the Biden administration get back into the nuclear deal with Iran before the election? Will Iranians be willing to accept a return to JCPOA in that brief period of time before the summer? Will the Biden administration ask to put extra issues on the table like Iranian involvement in Yemen or Iraq or Syria or the Iranian missile program? issues that were kept out of the original deal 
in order to try to make a clean, narrow deal on nuclear weapons. The other thing that we have to think of in terms of Iranian domestic politics is, the, is represented by the picture on the right-hand side of the screen. That's Qasem Soleimani. You might remember him as the person who the United States killed in uh, January of 2020. He was the head of what's called the Quds Force in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The Quds Force is the part of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran that operates overseas. And Soleimani was uh, integral to the Iranian influence efforts in Iraq and in Syria, Lebanon, even in Yemen. The United States killed Soleimani in retaliation for a number of, of actions that the Iranians took, one of which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, he represents, even in death, an element of Iranian politics that's extremely important. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the, the military unit within Iran that is tasked with the defense, not just of the country, but of the regime and with the spreading of the revolutionary ideology. What kind of leverage do they have in this period of Iranian politics? Would they accept, would the Supreme Leader to whom the Guard directly reports, would the Supreme Leader accept a simple return to the nuclear deal? These are the obstacles within Iranian politics itself that the Biden administration will face, as well as the issue of whether the Biden administration wants just a clean return or whether they wanna add issues to the negotiation with Iran. And remember, they only have a few months before the Iranian elections. So I think Iran is going to be the major focus of the Biden administration in terms of Persian Gulf policy at the outset of the administration. But of course, there's another country they have to deal with in the Persian Gulf region, and that's Saudi Arabia. We know that the Trump administration had an extremely close relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, in fact, much closer than one would have thought given Trump's rhetoric on the campaign trail about Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Trump administration did quite a bit to try to uh, make the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States even closer than it had been in the Obama administration. The Saudis being nervous about Iran liked the fact that Trump withdrew from the, uh, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. But there were also problems in the relationship with Saudi Arabia. The person on the left-hand side of the screen is, of course, Mohammed bin Salman, son of the king, crown prince. Day to day, he calls the shots in Saudi Arabia. The king still has a veto power over what happens, but Mohammed bin Salman is the, is, is the effective executive in Saudi Arabia. And he's done a number of things that have placed the US-Saudi relationship in, in, in some degree of tension. Probably the one most Americans uh, recognize is the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who's a, a Saudi journalist, uh, really a, a member of the regime in many ways, who became a critic of Mohammed bin Salman and his rather autocratic ways. Uh, you'll recall that in, in 2018, Khashoggi was killed at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, an embarrassment to President Erdogan, who's a player in, in regional political games, uh, and also uh, uh, created a crisis in the US relationship with Saudi Arabia because uh, Hashoji was uh, living in Washington at the time, uh, was well known in American circles and, and well liked and respected. Uh, and his killing was just seen as, as a, one more thing that Mohammed bin Salman did that demonstrated that he was uh, young, untested, uh, and unreliable, and was doing things in Saudi Arabia that uh, exceeded Saudi power, and that broke from the regular caution that people had expected in Saudi foreign policy in the past. The other main issue here, of course, is the Saudi intervention in the Yemen civil war, something that has gained quite a bit of criticism in the United States. The Saudis intervened in 2015 to try to prevent the Houthis, a, a, a Shia Muslim group in Yemen 
from dominating the country. Uh, and uh, there's been quite a bit of death and destruction and Yemen is a humanitarian crisis. Now you might think that, that the picture that I put up on the lower half of the screen would be a picture from Yemen, but it's not. One other factor for the Biden administration to consider as it looks at Saudi Arabia is the fact that in September of 2019, Iran launched a missile attack on the single most important oil facility in Saudi Arabia, the gathering plant at Abqaiq in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia, where over 50% of Saudi oil production is funneled into to prepare it for shipping out to world markets. Abqaiq is not only the most important oil facility in Saudi Arabia, in many ways, it's the most important oil facility in the world. 5% of the world's daily oil production comes through Abqaiq. The Iranians launched an attack on it, and this is a picture of the, uh, of the results of that attack back in September 2019. We tend to forget that because the oil market, uh, lots more supply than demand these days, particularly after COVID and the collapse of oil prices there. Uh, the attack on Abqaiq uh, didn't have an enormous effect on the market and the Saudis were able to repair the facility and get back on the market within a matter of weeks. However, Saudis remember that this was a direct attack on their most important asset. For decades, the United States has said it's in the Persian Gulf region to protect the free flow of oil. This was a, a, an effort, a direct attack on the free flow of oil. And the United States did virtually nothing in response. The Trump administration might say, well, look what we did to Qasem Soleimani a few months later. But people in Saudi Arabia and on the Arab side of the Gulf wonder about American credibility in the face of this American attack. So the Biden administration has a, a line to walk on Saudi Arabia. They don't particularly want a, a crisis with Saudi Arabia. I think the last thing the Biden administration wants is more crises in the Middle East. They wanna preserve a relationship with Saudi Arabia while at the same time signaling to Mohammed bin Salman very clearly that there are limits to what the Biden administration can accept in terms of his behavior in the region. I think that they'll be able to do that, but that's a task in front of the administration right now. One final point on this, uh, many people in, on the Arab side of the Gulf wonder about American credibility in terms of uh, the American military presence. There's quite a bit of, of talk about how America is leaving the region and you can understand why. Both President Obama and President Trump campaigned saying that they wanted to end the endless wars in the Middle East to get American troops out of the region and that they wanted to pivot to uh, the more, uh, what they saw as the more important strategic area with the rise of China, which is East Asia. However, in both cases, the Obama and Trump administrations, that pivot really didn't happen. When the Obama administration left office, there were about 50 to 60,000 American troops in the greater Middle East area. And when the Trump administration left office a few weeks ago, there were somewhere around 40,000 American troops in the region. That's not withdrawal. But still, people wonder about American credibility on the American side of the, on the, on the Arab side of the Gulf in particular. And Iranians wonder about American credibility. If we just wait them out, they'll leave. But I want to just show one more slide that I think indicates that American credibility and power in the region is still there. This is the picture of what has come to be called the signing of the Abraham Accords. This was sometimes called in, in the American media a peace treaty. It's not a peace treaty. It was a recognition by Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates of the state of Israel. And what you see from left to right is the foreign minister of Bahrain, the prime minister of Israel, President Trump, and the foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates. Now, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates signing a, a recognition deal with Israel doesn't change the geopolitics of the region at all. So why did they do it? They did it because the American president pressed them to do it. Even as he was at, in the last months of his time in office, President Trump was able to persuade and pressure the Bahrainis and the Emiratis and also the Sudanese and the Moroccans to formally recognize Israel because that's what he wanted them to do. 
I think that's an indication that U.S. power and U.S. credibility in the Gulf perhaps is not as low as it might be when, uh, uh, when you think about people who talk about American withdrawal or American credibility. The question going forward is what's America going to do with that power and that credibility? And I think for the Biden administration, step one is going to be re-engagement with Iran to see if it can get Iran back into the nuclear deal that limited Iranians, Iran's nuclear program and walked it back from possible weaponization. Thanks for having me virtually at the World Affairs Council of Monterey. And as I said at the beginning, I look forward to a time where I can uh, visit with you face to face. Thanks for your attention.